Hi everyone and welcome to my coverage of round 6 from the World Chess Championship 2014. The score remained tied at 2.5 each going into this game and it was the first game of two in a row where Carlsen would have the white pieces so it was an interesting juncture in the match. Carlsen kicked things off again with e4 which he has now played in all three games with white so it appears to be his move of choice thus far for the match. Anand again played the Sicilian with c5. He'd done this in game 4 as well, although that game didn't lead to any of the main lines, but it was still great to see as it showed fighting spirit. After knight f3, saw e6, which is the same variation as game 4, and Carlsen now did take the game into the main lines with d4. In game 4 we saw g3, and it went into a kind of offbeat um, isolated queen's pawn position. So uh, cd4, knight d4, now a6, which is the can variation. And this move a6 is to prevent knight b5, which can be annoying in uh, many of the lines, aiming for the d6 hole and gaining a tempo if the black queen is on c7, which is often the case. Carlsen now elected for the positional c4, which is no surprise given his style of play. Knight c3 is uh, the main line instead of c4, and bishop d3 is also very popular. And the point of this move is, is to set up a bind on the, the d5 square and prevent black from playing the d5 pawn push for as long as possible, as this move will liberate his game. So it's a classic Moroxy bind position. Anand's prep appeared to be in this can kind of variation because he played this as well in the e6 uh, line of the Sicilian in game 4. When he played e6 he didn't get to play a6 um, but yeah, this line with the e6 variation of the Sicilian seemed to be his preparation. Um, so it was interesting to see you know, what he had planned um, after e6 in Sicilian. So uh, knight f6 is how he continued and this is the main line so knight c3 so uh, knight f6 attacking e4, knight c3 defending it. Now bishop b4 pinning the knight, thereby renewing the attack on e4. And Carlsen, in his usual style, now played an offbeat move with queen d3 to defend e4. And bishop d3 is a lot more common, and uh, queen f3 is also quite fashionable at the moment. Anand, however, responded quite fast, uh, meaning that he knew these lines well, even the queen d3 line, which is you know not very common at all. So uh, knight c6, and now we saw some exchanges: knight c6, d c6, queen takes d8, check, king takes d8, and now e5. And allowing this is quite a surprising choice from Anand because it allows Carlson to take the game into exactly the kind of position in which he excels. So knight d7 is uh, attacking e5, so bishop f4, now bishop takes c3 check and b takes c3. Black doubles the pawns at the cost of the bishop pair, which is a kind of standard strategy in many openings. So white will have better pieces and more space, but black at least appears solid. Carlson has a small but safe edge in a very playable middle game, so it's exactly what he thrives on. It will be a slow positional maneuvering type of game as opposed to a tempo crucial tactical kind of game. Anand continued with the king c7 and the idea is to play b6, bishop b7 and uh, you know, that's going to connect the rooks and then play c5 and exert pressure down the long diagonal. Carlsen expanded immediately on the king's side with h4 and this seems to be the strongest and most direct way to create pressure on black. So b6, now h5, and Anand played h6 to prevent white from playing this move, which threatens, well, to take on g7 straight away, probably black has to play uh, g6, and uh, this is going to create some dark square problems. Um, so, yeah, after that, uh, well, actually, one more thing to point out is the, uh, the e5 pawn here is a real strategical asset because it prevents moves such as f6 and e5 which black would really want to play here and uh, if he plays that now it's simply going to take and there's a very weak pawn on e6 that uh, black has to defend or you know if, if um, 
F6 and EF GF than than H6 this week. Um, so um, Castle now Castle Long. And Bishop continue with Bishop B7. Now Rook D3 is preparing to swing a Rook over to the King side to attack G7, which is you know now a fixed weakness in the black position. So Nand continued with C5. This makes good positional sense, opening up the bishop, putting pawns on dark squares. Uh, now rook g3 and rook a g8 to defend g7. And it's important to defend with the rook, although it may look with this rook, sorry, um, because you know it might look that this makes that would make more sense to defend with the other rook. Uh, keep this rook flexible, for example, to go to d8. But after rook h g8, bishop d3, and bishop h7 is uh, threatened. You have rook h8 to attack it, then rook takes g7 is going to defend the bishop on h7. Um, so that's a completely flawed way to defend for black. So rook a g8 is correct. And now bishop d3. This is a good diagonal anyway, uh, especially as the play unfolds in the game. Um, and hand went for knight f8, and the idea is to play g6 in order to uh, challenge Carlson's pressure directly. And this move frees up the bishop on f4 from defending e5. Um, so bishop e3, and this has the idea of playing rook h4 to f4, attacking f7, and they're also playing a4, a5, undermining b6, sorry, undermining c5, where the bishop is uh, attacking. So, Anand continued with the g6. Now h takes g6, more or less forced, but still best. And uh, white is starting to build a decent edge now in uh, typical Carlson style. Knight g6 and black isn't uh, losing a pawn here because of the pressure against e5 from the knight. Um, yeah, so this means like uh, if if a bishop takes g6, uh, rook g6 is going to defend the h6 pawn. So this means that uh, black isn't losing a pawn here, but his position is still. Uh, kind of tied, you know, his pieces are getting tied to defending and getting tied to their squares, which generally isn't a good thing. Um, so rook h5 not only defends this pawn on e5, but it also prevents black from advancing further with the, the h-pawn, oh sorry, yeah, the, the, the h-pawn, which is uh, also um, advantageous for whites. And the question is put to black now as to how he's finding counterplay. Anand went for bishop c6, um, perhaps with some ideas like bishop a4 later and they're also supporting a later um, advance of the a pawn which black can try for counterplay um, and yeah this also prevents the idea of playing a4 a5 to undermine c5 um, and Carlson uh, took took this move seriously and played bishop c2 to support the a4 push if white wants to play it and also to prevent bishop a4 um, which you know is kind of annoying for white to deal with if he moves his bishop to challenge the bishop then he loses the bishop pair which is definitely an asset in uh, this position um, so Anand played king b7 which is a useful waiting move and it also ensures that after knight takes e5 there's no bishop f4 pin which can get kind of tactically tricky um, so it's important that he doesn't kind of uh, rush in any of his ideas, but of course this is only a counterplay idea. Uh, White has to allow this continuation, so Carlson is still in control here. So now uh, rook g4, which has uh, several ideas behind it. Um, one of them is in some lines to play g3 and ensure black isn't winning a pawn back on uh, g2 before taking any decisive action here on the king's side. Carlson is milking the position as much as possible. So a5, and Nand aims to gain some queenside space, although it's clear that his counterplay here is uh, virtually non-existent for now. Um, so uh, all he can really hope to do is defend accurately, and uh, it's, it's really a miserable position, to be honest, to uh, to try and hold. You know, There's no kind of active defense or anything like that he can pursue. So um, bishop d1 is what Carlson played, he's just continuing to strengthen his position. 
now rook d8 at least taking control of the open file um, and this counters the pressure on the queen, the king side with uh, a tactical idea um, so Carlson just brought the bishop back to c2 now with the threat of winning material with bishop g6 um, and yeah the idea is after if he plays instead of bishop h6 this would be a blunder knight takes e5 defend or deflects the h5 rook away from the defense of uh, h6 so rook takes e5 rook takes h6 and suddenly it's black who has the edge in this position both open files controlled and the pressure on g2 and uh, double pawns it's, uh, it's looking pretty good for black so of course uh, Carlsen didn't fall for that and he played uh, bishop c2 instead so Anand continued with rook d g8 and we have a repeat of the position and you know it's very instructive how Carlsen aims to get as much as he can out of the position before taking any kind of committal or decisive action but here came an incredible moment in the game Carlsen played king d2 which is an unbelievable tactical blunder one of the reasons Carlsen played a bishop d1 the uh, last time we had this position on the board was to protect the rook on g4 here and the fact that this rook is unprotected means that black now has a nice tactical shot um, white could have played for example f3 or uh, king d1 um, instead of king d2 um, and you know his advantage is just continuing to grow there um, so if you want to try and spot the uh, pretty much winning move here then uh, stop the video now a4 is what Anand played and he played it quite quickly within two minutes and you know it's fair to call this move a blunder as well because it missed the devastating knight takes e5 which hands black a huge advantage. Uh, the point is that this g4 rook is attacked um, by the knight so there's n nothing like a uh, rook takes e5 isn't working and there's no bishop f4 well it's not going to work is what I mean because um, Anand has moved his king to b7 it's on c7 before um, so you know that this move can be seven even set up this as a as a kind of trap but I mean there'd be no hope that Carlson was going to fall into this but it just so happened that that's how the game continued um, so anyway the best play would be rook takes g8 from uh, from white for for Carlson uh, if instead of rook f4 and f5 with uh, the threat of uh, rook takes g2 and also knight g6 threatening to trap the rook it's got no squares bishop's got here the pawns and the knight will have this square as well from g6 um, so that would be completely crushing and there's no other reasonable moves so rook takes g8 is forced and then uh, black has knight takes c4 check king d3 is best to attack the knight if anything else than simply rook takes g8 um, but now black has knight b2 check and you know any king move for example king e2 now rook takes g8 and black has won two pawns and he's headed into a very favorable end game um, if white takes on h6 then black just takes on g2 in order to remain two pawns up and if for example g3 now bishop b5 check and black is close to winning already as ideas like uh, bishop a4 and uh, rook d8 and it's looking very nice for example king f3 bishop a4 bishop b4 check is best now bishop c6 uh, for example rook h6 rook d8 the idea of bishop takes e4 and uh, knight a4 is very strong you know white's winning one pawn back doesn't really mean much after bishop takes c6 king takes c6 rook h7 and now rook d7 with the threat of uh, knight d1 is uh, very strong for black white can play for example bishop c1 is actually pretty much forced but then knight d3 bishop g5 and now b5 with b4 coming and black is virtually winning outright here so it was just an unbelievable miss from Anand who's usually a absolute tactical wizard um, and you know he'd been taking his time on almost every move 
except for this one so it's very ironic that uh, that should happen in the game and in the press conference afterwards Carlson mentioned that he saw knight takes e5 the moment after he played king d2 and that immediately panic started setting in <laughs> and you can see you feel his title uh, slipping away and uh, Anan said that he saw um, knight takes e5 immediately after he played uh, the well after missing it and playing a4 instead and of course uh, such a miss is very tough psychologically for the remainder of the game so can, we can return to it now anyway so Anand has just missed knight e5 and played a4 and Carlson continued with uh, king e2 he doesn't wait to be asked twice because the threat of knight e5 is still in the position um, even if white plays bishop h6 instead still knight e5 is working um, so a3 is how Anand continued and this is a chance for a breakthrough later with uh, b5 but it's risky because the pawn is now an attackable weakness um, so Carlson played f3 continuing to strengthen his position and milk it as much as possible before taking decisive action and uh, Anand is you know he's voluntarily making some weakening moves on the queen side and this is often a side effect of having a passive position it's very hard just to sit and do nothing and shuffle pieces from side to side so now we continued with the uh, rook d8 okay again taking the open file but there's no threat um, from this move and there certainly won't be any penetration points anytime soon because the bishops are controlling these four squares as well as the king um, so king e1 and uh, still Carlson doesn't want to take decisive action here it's uh, clearly winning a pawn now bishop g6 f g6 rook g6 but black is winning the g file after rook d8 rook g8 and rook g8 uh, although white remains considerably better here um, he wants to ensure that black has nothing whatsoever in the position so it's uh, Carlson again playing like Karpov just pure boa constrictor style he'll take position over material every time um, so rook d7 and uh, you know white's gonna have to give up the bishop here on c2 to win a pawn on the king side and this is why Anand is at least threatening to double rooks and penetrate to d1 um, if white does pursue that plan um, and this may also be one of the reasons that Carlson is delaying taking decisive action so bishop c1 is what he played here and white can now use the uh, weak a3 pawn as part of a maneuvering process he must also take care with accuracy at every step here if instead bishop h6 black stands better after knight e5 with the same tactical idea we saw before rook e5 and rook h6 suddenly with everything to play for and an, an edge for black so uh, bishop c1 now rook a8 to defend the a pawn and uh, also with the idea of playing bishop a4 and this is you know part of what um, Anand's play is about he has gained the space on the queen side of these squares so that he can play bishop a4 and trade off the light squared bishop and then have some penetration points and some counterplay ideas um, so Carlson played king e2 and uh, the point of this move is so that after trading on g6 uh, rook a d8 isn't going to come with tempo which it will if the king is on e1 because there's a threat of rook d1 check winning bishop on c1 and uh, this is an important finesse that has to be remembered in the position if white omits this then black is instantly equal again for example if he plays instead of bishop h6 here uh, yeah, bishop h6 now rook h8 bishop g6 f to f g6 is equal or if he plays um, instead of king e2 bishop g6 f g6 rook g6 rook a d8 and if now he plays king e2 then rook d1 um, bishop h6 is best now rook a1 and suddenly black is close to winning and through playing king e2 at the beginning instead white gains an important tempo to play rook takes h6 after the rooks are doubled on the d file which means he'll be able to play bishop g5 when uh, the bishop is challenged after rook d1 and uh, this changes everything and gives white a completely winning position so uh, king e2 now bishop a4 
and uh, bishop e4 check again very accurate from Carlson this is by far the best move if white goes for bishop takes g6 f takes g6 rook takes g6 black now has the tricky move bishop b3 which uh, saves the game and actually makes it a draw and is pulling off some nice tricks and uh, now we can see you know another of the ideas that he was doing in uh, advancing here on uh, on the um, queen side you know it looked very strange when when he first started doing it but it's all kinds of counterplay ideas which if you can see as as deep and as accurately as Vichy are uh, very useful to have up your sleeve um, and here the play would be forced a takes b3 a2 and white has to force the draw in order to save the game so it's a very resourceful play from Anand so bishop e4 check anyway from Carlson now bishop c6 and this move uh, was not best from Anand he uh, had to try king a7 instead but it's very hard when faced with such pressure throughout the game not to eventually go wrong and this is what Carlson does best he just keeps his opponent under pressure and keeps giving them problems to solve and you know there's not many who won't crack in such a situation so um, yeah now after bishop c6 he finally cashes in with the bishop takes g6 f takes g6 rook takes g6 so white wins a pawn but positionally he's way ahead the h6 and e6 pawns are just gonna drop like ripe apples after which there's no possible way that black can hold and Anand kept his counterplay ideas going with bishop a4 so Carlson chopped off another pawn with rook e6 he's not afraid of rook d1 attacking the bishop now we can simply gobble up a third consecutive pawn and bishop takes a3 Anand continued with rook a1 threatening rook a2 winning the uh, bishop because it's going to be check um, so in theory this is getting another pawn back um, Carlson played king e3 and now Anand collapsed with the uh, bishop c2 he could have played rook a2 and uh, this actually allows Carlson a very nice continuation pretty much all end games are winning from here anyway um, but there's one nice one we can have a look at a rook e7 check king a6 now bishop takes c5 and b takes c5 rook takes h6 check uh, king a5 rook c7 with a huge advantage to white, uh, rook takes c5 cannot be allowed um, with the bishop on a4 and in the meantime um, white has four pawns against the bishop and uh, these three pawns in particular are just going to be winning the game quickly um, so that would have been a nice one to see um, but after Anand's move bishop c2 uh, Carlson just plays rook e7 and here Anand had to resign because now bishop takes c5 uh, is going to just win another pawn because the, the b pawn is going to be pinned um, for example uh, king a6 has to be played as the only move to uh, not get mated quickly just about uh, rook takes a6 is winning for example rook a2 now bishop c5 and this pawn is pinned so um, yeah it's just four pawns up and obviously completely winning um, so Anand resigned as I said and it was a very dramatic game excellently played from Carlson and resourcefully defended by Nand but uh, the huge talking point was the glaring blunder with uh, King D2 which occupied almost all of the questions and answers in the press conference Carlson mentioned how it's very rare that you're not severely punished for making such a mistake at the Grandmaster level and it must have been a terrible blow for Anand he could easily have been a game ahead at the halfway point had he found a knight takes E5 and this would have stood him in great stead for the remaining half of the match. The entire progression of world chess could have been changed forever had he found that move. So it's going to be a very hard moment for him to move on from. And uh, as far as Carlson's concerned, he got a very lucky escape. And uh, both players were pretty hard on themselves in the press conference. And, you know, it was hard not to feel for Vichy. He was clearly demoralized after the game, but... He's really got no choice other than to pick himself up, dust himself off, and plow into the next game. So that'll take place on Monday morning, and uh, Carlson is now a point ahead, so Anand is really going to have to pull out all the stops 
if he wants to uh, keep any kind of chance in this match viable. So I'll get a video up uh, tomorrow evening if uh, all goes to plan. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks very much.